G'day. Welcome. Welcome to this time together. Hear the words of the psalmist. From Psalm 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Let's come before our God. Loving Father God, as we gather at this time, wherever we are and whenever we are, we are bound to each other and to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. We affirm, as the psalmist has, that you alone are our rock and our salvation, that you are our refuge, the one in whom we trust. And so we come to pour out our hearts before you, to open up our lives and receive the love and the healing, the peace and the joy that you offer. So Holy God, pour out your spirit, we pray. In a fresh way this moment. Anoint us, touch us, speak to us. That we might hear, understand and respond. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's sing a song of praise and worship. Jonah, Jonah the prophet. As I was speaking with a friend the other day and mentioned that I was going to use Jonah this week. 
He said, oh, you did that last year. And he's right, I did. I haven't gone back to see what I said. And if what I say now is what I said then, then maybe God's trying to tell you, me, the world, something. And we need to hear it more than once. And if it's a new insight, then thanks be to God. Jonah the prophet, called by God, ran away from God. Dragged by God, kicking and screaming to the task that God had appointed for him. And completed that task with hard heart. God did amazing things. So it seems to me, Jonah knew God. Jonah heard God. Jonah knew God's command and will. And that in itself is amazing. Can you imagine? Really hearing palpably. And time again, God does that. And I've known that in my life. And many of you have too. Have heard the voice of God. Have seen or received a word from God in various ways. Hear... We have a story of this prophet who hears from God, who has a concrete understanding of what it is that God wants. I find that just so exciting. Something that we should be anticipating and desiring for ourselves and those around us. And then, He didn't like what he heard because his heart was hardened to what God's love was trying to do in the world. Because his attitudes and prejudices superseded and superimposed themselves over the love that he knew in God. He chose to go another way. And yet, God doesn't write him off. God doesn't go, oh, well, I'll just find someone else. God has chosen this man for this purpose. And so God pursues. God keeps hounding. And I've certainly known that in my life. Where God just won't let up. And God keeps going, yeah, you, 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 come on, come on. And eventually, kicking and screaming, Jonah goes. He goes where God is calling. Not because he wants to, but it has become unavoidable for him. He reluctantly does what God asks. And there is a sense where in his heart he wants to fail. He wants to be like so many of the other prophets whose message is not heard by those that they bring it to. He does not want the people of Nineveh to repent, to turn from all of the stuff that they were doing and thinking and being involved in and turn to God. And yet they do. Here, the reluctant prophet becomes a successful prophet without stopping being reluctant or resistant. For the people of Nineveh repent. How amazing is that? You know, we look to, to those who are fired up and full on and go, you know, they're the ones that, that are going to do great stuff for God. And they are. But our God is bigger than us. Our God is bigger than our desires, our commitments, our energy for the things of God. And here in this story, miracle of miracles, the people repent when they hear from a prophet who doesn't want them to. And then a shade is provided and he still grizzles. His selfishness, his pride, 
and his lack of love. And yet all through this, God achieves what God set out to achieve. The repentance of the people of Nineveh. How much more? How much more could be achieved if we enthusiastically embrace what God is doing? That is our challenge. For this is a cautionary tale. Don't be like this Jonah. This is a story of good news. God's love extends to us when we rebel. When we ignore God's voice. When we run away from God's mission. When we are grumping, whingy, selfish and unloving. God's love extends to us. And God's love extends to them. Whoever the them might be, God's love extends to those who we wish it didn't, who we in our judgmental moments come to believe it doesn't. God's love extends to them. To Nineveh, to all. For that is the promise. And that's good news. It's good news for us when we are the them. It's good news for us when we have hurt God. God's love extends to us. And the good news is this. That God will get done what God wants done. Whether we want it. Whether we engage with it. Whether we embrace it and cooperate or not. The good news, for it is good news, is that this God who can get it done despite us, without us, invites us, calls us to be agents of grace. The challenge that we hear again in this story is to love those that God loves. To do what God calls us to do. How God instructs us to do it. To be grateful for a God who is both loving and our provider. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we hear again the story of Jonah. A story in which we can get distracted by big fish, storms. A story in which we can divorce ourselves from or step outside of. Because that was then over there, not here and now. But in our heart of hearts, we know. That there are days when we are Jonah. There are days when we are Nineveh. And we need your love. We need your voice and your word coming to us. Helping us to see. Our need. To turn to you. So Lord God forgive us. Forgive us for our hardness of heart. Forgive us for our prejudices and our unwillingness to embrace those that you love. Forgive us for our selfishness. And forgive us for all of those times where we choose not to engage in the things of your kingdom. And we choose not to look for your call, to listen for your voice, to follow your instructions to us. Forgive us for the many ways in which we seek to be self-sufficient. 
rebellion to your loving provision. God, our God. Pour out your love upon us now. For we are in desperate need of you. Honour the promise you made. To be our saviour. And to forgive us our sin. For we trust now to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we are forgiven. And so it is, as grateful children, we come in prayer for our world. We pray for all those places that are struggling under the burden of disease. For all those that grieve the loss of a loved one, the loss of identity, work, and place for all those that are in need of healing body mind and soul we pray for leaders everywhere leaders of nations organizations churches governments Communities, families, God, may our leaders be humble, courageous and resilient. May our leaders look to you for wisdom, may our leaders Look to us with love as we seek to build families and communities, nations and a world where justice, mercy, peace and joy, hope and love are known by all. Come, holy God. Do what you have promised in this your creation, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's sing a song. Chapter 1. 
After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. To follow Jesus is to commit to a life of repentance and belief. John is arrested, and Jesus makes his way to the northern region of Galilee, doing preaching, proclaiming the good news of God, which is the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. This is the good news that Jesus preaches. Repent. Believe, for the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. It is in this context, in this background, that Jesus calls the brothers Simon and Andrew and not long thereafter James and John. He calls them to turn from what they know, to turn from their commitments to family and business, to turn from a focus of things of the workaday week and step into the world of the wandering preacher in occupied Palestine. For this is the call. To turn from their known to God. To turn from what was their space and believe believe because the kingdom of God has come near that kingdom was present in Jesus he called them he calls us to turn to him and believe in the church we throw around the word repent we use it a lot. And we need to understand what it means at heart. That repentance is more than a feeling. It's more than woe is me. Oh, I've done something wrong. It's more than an attitude of I want to do differently. Repentance is an action. It's a deliberate act of will of body, mind, and spirit. It is a readiness to turn to God from whatever we have been focused on. It's a desire to set aside our stuff, our key stuff for God. It is an active looking for the way of Jesus. This is a fascinating passage. This is the ministry Jesus calls them to. And they, these men, are the first called to repent and believe. To turn away from their old lives and believe that something new is happening in Jesus. With all of the pressures that come with that, with all of the challenges that come with that. And we know as we read the scripture that again and again, these men stumble. These men become fixated on things that are not of the kingdom of God, that are not of the way of Jesus. And Simon Peter seems to be the torch bearer for those that stumble, for those that are passionate and want to be faithful but mess it up. He goes in front of us to show us not only the truth of our fallibility, but of the grace of God. 
the love that Jesus comes to live. The call to repentance is not a call to exclusively move away from some dark, deep sin. It is a call to refocus on God. To ensure that God has primacy in our lives. These men were called to leave all behind to follow Jesus. That call has not changed. We are called to follow. Now, part of their call was to be fishers of men, to be part of the gathering up of the people, to the reaching out to the world. It's not about building churches and waiting for people to come in. It's not about having the most modern, best, oldest music, video production, whatever. It's not about creating something that will draw people in. It's about going out and meeting them with what is. That is the love of God. The good news. That if we repent, if we reorientate our mind, if we focus away from all that distracts, and focus on God, there is life and life abundant. So what does this call to repentance mean for followers of Jesus? What does it look like in our personal lives, in our devotional lives, in the way in which we expend the minutes and hours of our day? What does it mean for the way in which we spend what we own. How much of our ordinary, uneventful lives are dedicated to the way of Jesus? And one of the real dangers, and it's always been a danger, is that the Christian faith becomes an accessory to living rather than the springboard of life. And it happens easy. And part of the repentance is to be open and aware to that reality so that every moment of every day when we realize we have lost our focus, we stop and we refocus. Every day in our personal lives, in our family living, in our church life, in our community life. What does it look like when we come to worship, for our focus to be on God, not on music, not on preaching, not on pews, rules, and traditions, but on God, on Jesus, on the Spirit coming near. What does it look like when we do that? When it no longer matters who sits where, what people wear, how much people put in the plate, what the order of service looks like, what the tradition says, but what does God say? And we may well find that many of the things we do are helpful in orientating ourselves to God. And if they are, praise be to God, we have been faithful. But if they're not, then maybe we need to allow those things to be challenged, whether it's internal attitude or external action. What does it mean to repent when we are passionate about things, about agendas, about circumstance? Our passions because our passions can so, mis so easily misdirect us away from God. I grieve over a friend who, out of their experience of God and their faith, became passionate about working with underprivileged people, 
people who were living below the poverty line. And so they threw themselves at working in that space and trying to provide for people who had nothing in advocacy, in training, in accessing external resources with which to bless the community. And a number of years down the track, after having thrown themselves at this cause, driven to it by their experience of God, they renounced their Christian faith. And I grieve over that. Because what I believe happened was that they allowed their passion to supplant their faith. And they allowed the heartbreak of that space to corrupt their belief. And they did some beautiful work. They blessed so many people. But in the end, because their eyes were taken off God, they became a burnt out wreck. I lost track of where they are and what they're doing. But in still moments, I still pray that they would find the healing and the grace that is ours in God. So what does it mean for your passions to repent and follow Jesus? And what does it mean for those things that we think we know, for those things that for us are absolute truths, What does it mean to be open to turning from what we would hold as our banner to the truth of God? For this was the challenge to these men. They were men of faith who had to choose to believe that this Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. When so many far more well-educated religious people could not, these men did. My experience is that for all of us, there are things that we hold on to that are almost foundational and core to who we think we are. That God needs us to let go of if we are to focus fully on Him. Friends, we need those sure things that we believe, but we need to have the openness to recognize that we are not God. And so we come to the Scriptures, we come to our experience. And we come to the word of God brought to us through the Holy Spirit. We come with the wisdom of the tradition. And it is in that space that we must turn ultimately to God. For this is our reality. This is our truth. All the areas of our life can distract us from our focus on the way of Jesus. And that there will be times when we are called to turn away from stuff we feel is precious. Things, hopes, dreams, attitudes, all that distract us from God. Are we willing to humble ourselves? Are we courageous enough to pray, God, show me my sacred cows. Show me that which Jesus is calling me from. Convict my heart, compel my soul, and teach my mind. Jesus is calling you, me, us. 
and the world to follow him. Will we? Really? Fully? Repentantly? Believing in his power and his grace? For he is Lord and Saviour. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we see the call of the early disciples and we know that their call is our call. That their good news they knew is good news for us even when we do not understand it fully. And we know that true repentance is seen in our actions. And so we pray that by your Spirit we might be convicted of body, mind and soul to set aside all that distracts us from you. That we might be wise and discerning in what you call us to and how you call us to it. That we might be patient and loving with those around us as they struggle to hear the call. We pray that they would be patient with us in our struggles. Loving Father God, we are your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, show us your kingdom. Come near. In Jesus' name, Amen. Friends, let's sing. So as we go this day, do we wander or do we follow? It's our choice. And our choice will be seen in the fruit of our lives. May God's grace and love rest upon you this day, bless you and empower you to be the one God created you to be. Grace and peace, in Jesus' name. Amen.